Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, welcome back to the break. Uh, so, as we mentioned, my name is Andrew M, and this talk is going to get into some crazy experimental extensions of the React life cycle. So it may be a bit technical at times, I'm warning you in advance. Uh, secondly, I've been hanging out in this beautiful city for the last three days, uh, but I'm going to point with the dry air is starting to affect my throat. Just chug like three gallons of water and see if we can get through this. Uh, let's go. Uh, as I said, my name is Andrew M. I lead JavaScript development at Parse, and we're actually part of Facebook. And what we do at Parse, if you haven't heard of us, is we provide backend services for app developers. These are things like push notifications, on-demand code execution, analytics. The biggest of all is data storage. So with our SDK and a few lines of code, you can be instantly saving and retrieving objects to and from our servers in no time. Basically, we really love building great developer experiences. So it turns out that React and I actually go really far back. Uh, for the conference, I looked it up, figured out what my first React-related commit was, all the way back in June 2012. Um, sometimes I like to think of myself as a little bit of a React hipster, but the truth is, uh, actually I totally lucked into it. I was an intern at Facebook three years ago, and I found myself working on a team that was building what was then an experimental JavaScript library. Three years later, here we are at a conference dedicated to it, which I think is really awesome. But it has given me a lot of time to explore React and really use and mostly abuse it and push it in new directions. So the story of this particular talk begins last December. As a parse engineer and a React developer, I was trying to answer the question, how do I take data stored on parse and integrate it seamlessly into an application built with React? And so I started to explore this from a bunch of different angles, and as I came to better understand the problem, I formalized three major goals that I wanted to achieve with whatever I built. The first is that components should be able to specify their data. And I'll be totally upfront with this, I completely stole this from the Relay team, but that's because it works. It embraces those React ideas of self-contained components and encapsulation, and it lets you create really testable, reusable code. Now the second piece was that components should be able to stay in sync with their changing data. So if I'm an end developer, I have one, 10, 100 components subscribed to the same data point, whenever that data point changes, all of my UI should refresh in turn without the developer having to externally trigger anything. And thirdly, this is probably the most important thing I wanted to uh, achieve, was that the experience needed to feel like a natural extension of the React ecosystem in the life cycle. I didn't want developers who have already spent time learning about this idea that uh, view is derived from state, and state is modified by external triggers and uh, events. I didn't want them to have to add a totally new, I guess, way of thinking into that mix. And so after I synced up with the React team, it actually became clear that a lot of these points fit into what was then a recent proposal to allow React components to subscribe to this abstraction known as observables. And so observables, they're actually stupidly simple, but they're really powerful when you use them properly. And they're basically PubSub on steroids. What they let you do is specify callbacks should, that should be received when uh, any new data is available, but you can also specify parameters over these uh, callbacks and these registrations. Now, the interface that we were looking at was inspired by this reactive extensions project, which was out of Microsoft. And uh, that's the website you can find. If you ever heard of RxJS, RxJava, these things, they've built a huge ecosystem around this concept of observables and subscriptions. And so we ran with these ideas, and we built a way that we could fit observables and subscriptions into the standard React component. And what we achieved were a number of things. First, much like rendering, we made it so that subscriptions were actually a function of state. This means that just as your render function is saying, state tells me that this is how my component should look, now we can also say that state tells me this is what my component needs to really be its full self. And the second is that components, they get to update in response to your data. This is just the same way that when your state changes or your props change, we want it to have that re-render loop. So whenever data comes back from an observable, it gives your component a chance to re-render. And your render function is really where all the logic related to these observables needs to be. And so thirdly, we wanted to hide a lot of this stuff from the end developer because it wasn't necessary for them to manage their own subscriptions. And so we handle uh, all of these subscriptions and the unsubscribing within the component. And what this does is it gets to a very 
crucial part of dealing with any sort of observable interface and something that a lot of people might dislike. And that's it's really easy to trip yourself up and get memory leaks. If you subscribe to something and forget to dispose of that later, you end up with all these orphan subscriptions. But because we tie that not only to the render life cycle, but also the component mount and unmount points, uh, we made so you never end up with orphan subscriptions. And we actually took all these things, and what we built was this library binding parse data to React applications. Uh, it's cleverly called Parse Plus React. And we launched it at F8 this past year, Facebook's developer conference. And it's really been a proof of concept that subscriptions can affect the way that you uh, develop React applications. Now, I remember that I was developing this library for months and months, and I was really focused on uh, the details and the perf and getting it so it wouldn't crash all the time. And it wasn't until the very last week when I was building example applications to put in the repo that I realized that this really does speed up and simplify the developer process because you no longer have to worry about manually updating components whenever you get the data. Now, disclaimer time. Before we get any further into this presentation, I want to clarify a few things in case you're getting the wrong ideas. The first is that this is not just for remote data. I'm sure that's how we actually get queries into, um, or queries over Parse React into your application. But if it were only for fetching Ajax requests, I don't think I'd be talking about it today. It's so much more than that, and most of the effects are really on the client side. And the second is that everything we're going to talk about today is a totally experimental API. Names are up for grabs, functions are up for grabs. We've been using it in the Parse Plus React library for the last five months successfully, and we've had a lot of people build applications with that. But I'd love to see this thing grow and change. So I'm hoping that with this talk, and with the general repositories that we're going to release, hopefully later this week, we can get the larger React community, you guys, into sort of exploring this field of new ways to inject data into React applications. And maybe we can find things that were missing originally. For instance, uh, it wasn't until four months into the Parse React project was public that people started asking about hooks for uh, catching data before they actually got to the readers. And so, again, as I want everyone here to be able to explore these on their own, what we're going to release is an open source generic implementation of observables, nothing tied specifically to Parse data or anything like that. And what this will probably be is a mix-in that will let any component subscribe to observable data, and a base component if you want to go to the more ES6 extensive route, which I personally recommend. And then we'll also provide some observable data sources because you can't really play with these things unless you have something to send you data. Okay, so before we talk about the uh, getting the data into your application, into your components, in fact, before we talk about any of the React pieces at all, we really should discuss what kinds of data benefit from being observed. Why can't I just inject it into my component directly or just set it up with a promise? Well, so during this talk, I'll mention two types of data. Sometimes I'll talk about asynchronous data. Other times I'll talk about continuously changing data. And the truth is that both of these are things that really benefit from being subscribed to. These are things that when data is available, you want your component to automatically update to reflect that new data. And I think the best way to generalize these two different cases is to consider it as information that's available after mount time. And you can kind of see how this fits into both the asynchronous and the continuously changing areas. So let's say you're on React Native and you're pulling some values from a disk. You don't actually know what values you need until your component first mounts. And because that's an asynchronous process, you also know that that data is not going to be available until some time after mount. And so as a developer, it'd be really great to just declare this dependency and have your component automatically respond whenever that data is available. Maybe it's already available through cache. Um, but if you can write your component to be totally agnostic to where it's coming from, that really speeds up the process. Another example, when we talk about continuously changing data, that could easily be your more traditional flux store. So when you have a bunch of objects in your application, you want to be able to watch as they're changed, added, deleted. And so you can subscribe components to specific subsets of these uh, objects, and you can have your UI automatically respond as they change. But it doesn't have to be traditional app data. When you think about things that are stored as rows in a database, subscriptions, I think, get most powerful when you're dealing with more abstract or local concepts. So 
these could be things like specific pointers when they change to different objects. And I think my favorite example that we'll cover at the very end of this talk is actually subscribing to the dimensions and the scroll points of your browser window. So you can implement reactive or responsive React layouts. Okay, so now we know what kind of data we might be looking at. How does it get into the component? Well, we've actually added a new lifecycle function, just sort of like render. It's called observe. What observe does is that's where you declare, every time your component re-renders, your data that you're going to subscribe to. And what it returns is actually a mapping of names to observable objects. The names tell us where to put the data when it arrives, and the observables are where you specify criteria, and you can say, you know, for instance, I want to query over all parse objects of the comment class with, that were created within the last five minutes. And when the data actually comes back, there's a new top-level object as well, this.observe. Now, we would have liked to put this in props or state, but the truth is, it's not like props or state. It's something else in that you're having someone explicitly inject a value from some external place. You're not passing it from a parent, you're not updating it locally. And so, when you were specifying the name and the observable in your observe method, this also tells us where to attach the value. So observe will be a mapping of strings to different values that are coming back from whatever you're watching, whether that is a local database or a file from disk. And so, as I said, observed is this new top-level data source. And you can think about it a lot like props in state, in that every time it changes, your component has the chance to re-render. And you can write your render functions assuming that this is always available in some form. But at the same time, as I said, it's not, it's not like props or state in that it's passing linearly. It's not related to the tree view at all. When the original proposal was made for subscriptions in React components, it was actually called sideways injecting data. And that's true, is that this is precision injection of data into whatever parts of your DOM tree need it. It's totally divorced from the concept of the React tree, it has nothing, it doesn't care what other components might also be subscribed to the same data. Your code can look exactly the same. So whenever your component is running, this observe method becomes part of its lifecycle. When it mounts that first time, you get a chance to first subscribe to your um, various observables. And this also gives your observables a chance to synchronously pass data into your component for its first render pass. Now, if you're waiting on an AJAX request, this could be a, a null value. Um, but if you are, say, you know, observing the browser dimensions, you already know what that value is synchronously, and you can push that through the first time your component mounts. But as I said, you know, observe, this is actually a function of state. So every time your state changes, you get the chance to change your subscriptions. And this can be something like, say, a query over data with a limit and a skip. Classic pagination scenario. You can set up an observable that subscribes to data with a skip that's related to whatever page you're currently on, and that's, that page can be stored as part of your state. So when you increment and you click that button, you say go from page one to page two, it changes you know, this.state.skip. And your observable gets a chance to automatically unmount the old subscription and create the new subscription and fetch that data into your component. And so this is, you can see how this is more powerful than just a standard pub sub type scenario, because you can have criteria over these subscriptions. So the best part about these is that they're totally managed internally. As a developer, and really, I was focused on developer experience when we were exploring this, as a developer, almost nothing changes when you don't actually have to think about the observables or destroying them or creating them or anything like that. You simply declare what you need in your observe method and you fetch data from this.observe. And so what ties into that also is it's self-cleaning. This is where we get to avoid those memory leaks. So, Every time your component changes its observables, it actually unsubscribes all the old ones and creates all the new ones. And it does so in a way that if you have an observable that's maybe keeping a ref count and it knows who is subscribed, you can always guarantee that the number of subscriptions is greater than or equal to the number of components currently watching. And so when that count gets down to zero, your observable can clean up whatever handlers it needs to. This is all designed to prevent memory leaks. So what is an observable data source? What can I put in this observed method to pass data to my components? Well, quite frankly, anything is an observable data source as long as it provides a subscription method. And the best part is that all the details, all the implementation is totally divorced from React in every way. In fact, you don't even need to use observables with React. 
Um, React components simply subscribe to observables and they get data back. Observables just know that they're pushing data where data is needed, but neither knows about who's on the other side of this interface. And it creates this perfectly divorced area where components don't know where data is coming from and data doesn't need to necessarily know about the React rendering cycle or worry about that in any way. It's this magical separation of concerns. And what this lets you do is implement observables and keep layering new layers of, say, cache and things on them, and it doesn't have to change your component in any way. If you started off with an observable that was fetching a simple AJAX request, and you wanted to add caching, and you want to add extra criteria over it, and you want to add formatting, these are things that you can do totally within your observable object, and the interface from the React component onwards does not change. So, as I said, anything could be an observable. You just have to provide the subscription method. This is what gets called every time your React component tries to subscribe to new data. This is where you provide your uh, callbacks. So you say, you know, when I get a new piece of data, call on next. When you get an error, call on error, because I kind of want to see that too, and give people a chance to say, retry posting their data again. Okay, enough of the you know, abstract talking. Let's just see what this actually looks like in real code, because I think this is where the magic comes in. This is the simplest uh, example I could come up with from the Parse Plus React library. And this is a component that's going to watch over a bunch of expenses in a, a Mint-like application, and it's gonna get all the ones that are for the current month, and we're paginating over month. So we have these two methods, render, which is going to display the data that we've gotten back, and observe, which is gonna tell us these are our subscriptions, we wanna watch these, we wanna know when they change, locally or on the server. And so when this component mounts, the first thing we get is uh, observe runs. And it creates this mapping of the word expenses to this observable. It's a query over this data with these specific criteria. And now if we already have that data cached, we can immediately push it to the component. Otherwise, we'll spin up an AJAX request. We're going to go wait on the server. But the component is immediately going to pass to its render function. And it's going to render whatever the synchronous value of this observable is, I believe, with Parse React. It's actually just an undefined when you say, you know, I'm still pending data. And that's where you can show your loading indicator, your spinner, whatever you want. And then when that AJAX request completes, it's actually gonna call back into this component, force it to re-render, and without any sort of explicit developer things, you don't have to attach the AJAX request here, you don't have to have any promises, your component just automatically responds to new data being available. Of course, as I said, the most powerful things are not when you're dealing with application data, but when you're dealing with more abstract concepts. So this is something that we also provide with the Parse React library, is that the Parse SDK lets you manage your users. You can sign up, you can log in, you can log out. And so we provided an observable that watches this pointer that represents the current user. If it's null, you don't have a user yet. If it is actually a user, that'll be provided there. And what this lets you do is write components in this form. You can always say, you know, if this user value is available, it's not null, then we render our application. But if it is null and we don't yet have this logged in user, we show this login display. And this is your top level component in most applications and nobody, you know, it simplifies the process that nobody owns the user, nobody owns this sort of state, nobody does any sort of set state, set prop sort of thing. It's just that whenever the developer decides that they want to call, the, on the normal Parse SDK, they decide to call uh, login with this username and this password, that updates this pointer and tells this observable, hey, any components that are watching the current user right now, let them know that we have one. So if we think about the more abstract uh, asynchronous example, I keep coming back to Ajax. And why is that? Well, because if you look at the original React tutorials, they're always, uh, I think one of the original examples is, um, they subscribe to uh, some endpoint, and then when it comes back, they set state with the value. And these are things that we've been doing for ages, and we try to move them into sort of different external abstractions, but it's still sort of the same thing that you're watching a promise. With this Ajax example, you know, you're not waiting on continuously changing data, you don't have a stream, but instead, what you want to do is subscribe in a way that is totally ignorant but efficient uh, of the rest of the DOM. So we can batch request. If I have five components that are subscribed to the same endpoint, I can inject that data directly to those components, and I can, uh, but I can run that on a single AJAX request. And similarly, I can have caching. So as I mentioned, you're not just watching for data, you're also specifying criteria. I could easily implement an observable thing that says, hey, 
I want this Ajax request at this endpoint, go to the GitHub API and get me these comments. But if you have a cached request from the last five minutes, I'll also take that. And so you can have observables where you're managing all these extra layers of asynchronous processing and components don't even know where the data is coming from. They don't need to know. You're just pushing it directly in. And finally, this is my favorite example, is you can observe the window dimensions. And so this might be useful maybe if you want to have some fancy scroll effects and you have components that just depend on that. Or you can have, you know, booleans. So you can have an observable that says, you know, watch the window width, watch the window resizes, throttle that, and then whenever it fits these new criteria, push this new boolean to any component that is watching. So I could have tons of components that are going to re-render themselves based on the user switching their browser window from being a full screen to a half screen. And it's not going to ever affect the DOM tree. It's not going to keep pushing state and data to the components until it's necessary because you're specifying these criteria of this observable. And so what you can actually do with this is you can implement responsive displays. Um, one of my favorite examples is that when you're implementing sort of a full table display, you have um, you know, a bunch of columns and uh, each row has all that laid out widthwise. But if you're doing it with a mobile setup where you have a very narrow window, it's not the best experience. And it might be better to display those more as cards. And so you can render this based on your state of whether the window is wide or narrow enough. And so if you start off with a wide display, you know, you can, you can render your table and as it shrinks, you can suddenly have your UI respond to these different varying changes. Um, additionally, because these things are synchronous, you know, you may not ever have these changes um, occur during your runtime. Maybe you're just on a mobile device, you're not resizing a window. But the one thing you'll see is that it's the same code on, uh, sorry, it's the same code on uh, both components. And so you don't have to have extra code around, you know, processing, um, you know, f fetching this data or where it's coming from, caching again. It's all just handled externally and one piece of code manages all these things. So, as you can see, this is really, these are really abstract thoughts. Um, but I want us to hack on it you know, collectively. So we've been exploring this with Parse React for the last five or so months. And in that time, we've done things where we have a Flux store, uh, Flux-inspired store, that subscribes to various data and components watch that data. And so in that scenario, you can have, say, a table that's rendering uh, those expenses for the current month as we saw. And as new objects are added or removed from that set, that's when your entire UI becomes responsive and it uh, affects these changes without ever the developer triggering these things. And so, and then you have those other pointer type things. You respond to the current user. As the current user logs in and out, your UI automatically responds without you know, any sort of if statements or anything like that, triggering promises, triggering callbacks. These things all happen automatically in the background. There's a wide world for us to take these subscription services and explore injecting data into different parts of the DOM. Uh, the window example really just came about as I was trying to see how far I could abuse this topic. Um, and actually, it's become pretty awesome. We're using it uh, in the new version of the Parse website. These are things that it takes a while to think about in a totally different way. It's not the standard React lifecycle. But it fits in in a similar way. And so what we're going to do is, as I mentioned in the beginning, release a bunch of open source repositories. This will be under the React.js uh, GitHub org, which is where we have a lot of other experiments. And so what we'll have there are, um, we'll have pieces such as uh, mix-ins, base components, and uh, a bunch of example subscribables. And so you can start using these um, and hopefully build out this ecosystem because also, as I mentioned, these subscribables, these observables, they're not tied to React in any way. You can use these with any other system. And so maybe as we keep exploring this further, we, we settle on, on naming conventions and all those, those nitty gritty things, but we also start to grow almost its own ecosystem of available libraries. And you can have things where you can subscribe to uh, index DBs or uh, all sorts of React Native specific things. You can subscribe to um, horizontal and vertical uh, rotations. Now these are things that if you can have any sort of changing data source or asynchronous data source, you can have your UI automatically respond to it with these uh, systems. Uh, that's all.